Welcome, everyone. Uh, I'm Bruce Shapiro. I'm executive director of the DART Center for Journalism and Trauma, a project of Columbia Journalism School, which is devoted to reporting on, on violence, crisis, and tragedy uh, around the world. Uh, one of the, what well, welcome to this particular conversation for journalists, the, uh, the latest in our series. Um, this one on covering fires amid climate change. Um, this is perhaps the signature catastrophe of the last 12 months, um, a signature natural catastrophe um, in several places around the world on the west coast of the US where right now um, hundreds of thousands of acres are still burning and uh, certainly in Australia which over the last year experienced massive devastation across several states. Um, the growth, the intensity, the growing intensity, and the sheer scale of destruction of these fires um, poses unique challenges to journalists that we're gonna talk about today. Uh, the scale of destruction, the risk to journalists' lives and the risk to communities, and the, the challenge of reporting the aftermath have always been part of the terrain of covering fires. But now the scale is greater and we can add to that the challenge of contextualizing these events amid the science of climate change. We are lucky today to have an extraordinary transcontinental panel of journalists from the US and Australia who have devoted large parts of their career to reporting on these catastrophic events and who've thought long and hard about the craft, the skills, um, the ethics involved. I am lucky since fires are one kind of disaster that I've never covered, large scale natural fires, to be able to hand off the reins in a minute to uh, someone who is a master at this uh, Karen Percy, uh, who will moderate this event. Karen Percy is the chair of Dart Center Asia Pacific. She has more than 30 years of journalism experience, primarily at the Australian Broadcasting Corporation in Melbourne, as well as having worked in Southeast Asia, uh, in Moscow, and elsewhere. Um, as a foreign correspondent, she's covered a coup and assassination, protest movements, and natural disasters. Back home, she's covered crime scenes in the courts, but she also um, has vast experience covering um, the annual ritual and now worsening annual catastrophe of bushfires in Australia. She will lead us through three speakers. Uh, my friend Peter Drought, who is senior camera operator TV News and Current Affairs at the Australian Broadcasting Corporation in Australia. Lizzie Johnson, a reporter at the San Francisco Chronicle who frequently writes about environmental issues. Uh, she led the Chronicle's coverage of wine country wildfires, the most destructive blazes in state history. She's also worked at the Chicago Tribune, the Dallas Morning News, and she's written a book on California's wildfires that will be coming out in 2021. Lauren Markham is a fiction writer, essayist, and journalist whose work focuses on issues related to youth, migration, the environment, and her home state of California. Markham is the author of The Faraway Brothers, Two Young Migrants, and The Making of an American Life. And her work has appeared in outlets such as Harper's, The New York Review of Books, Mother Jones, California Sunday, and Narrative. Um, we are going to hear from Karen, who will lead the conversation with Peter, Lizzie, and Lauren, and then we'll go to Q&A. When we do, we'll ask you to put your questions into the chat, which some of you actually already started doing, and if you want to start pouring them into the chat as the conversation goes along, that's fine, or you can wait till the Q&A and just, just put them in the chat, um, and then we'll, we'll pull them out of there, which will minimize problems with bandwidth, Zoom bombing, and other other hazards of socially distanced journalism conversation. Uh, Karen, why don't you take us where we need to go? Thank you, Bruce. Um, and thank you all for joining us. I think we've got uh, probably mostly 
uh, folks from the US, but I have noticed that one or two names that I recognise from Australia. So thank you so much. Uh, Peter and I will try to speak slowly because we know that uh, with our vernacular and uh, uh, we have a tendency not to be understood at times. So we'll do our very best um, to make things uh, clear for you. So I'm really honoured to be here. The Dart Centre is something that is very, very close to my heart. Um, I've done a number of, uh, I did a fellowship and then I was senior fellow and uh, I'm a peer supporter, uh, was a peer supporter with the ABC. That's something Peter uh, is going to be talking about as well. Peter Drought, he was a co-founder of uh, this world cast program um, uh, led by the Darts, um, Darts Centre's Kate McMahon. So Lauren, Lizzie, Peter, welcome. Fabulous to have you here. We have to go to Lizzie first because she's actually got her protective equipment on. She's at a wildfire zone. Doesn't get more uh, any better than that in terms of having a discussion about fires. So Lizzie, tell us a little bit about where you are and, and put us into context who you are too. Yeah, I am luckily in a place that has cell service sitting on a tree stump um, in the High Sierra, which is where the creek fire has been burning for more than a month now at this point. I've covered wildfires for the San Francisco Chronicle since 2015, um, basically full time since the wine country wildfires in 2017. So I've spent a lot of time breathing in smoke and covering these disasters. And what will you be doing today? We'll, we'll understand if you have to run off at some stage, but give us a bit of an <laughs> idea of how your day is going to play out. Or I guess it's towards the end of your uh, day, I'm, isn't it? Yeah, I'm still trying to figure it out. So much of my job is just showing up at these fires and trying to find some kind of human story that encapsulates the wildfire crisis the state is experiencing. So I will let you know as soon as I figure it out. Uh, we'll go to you, Peter. You've um, been, a journal, uh, been a camera operator with the ABC for many decades, um, seen your fair share of really bad wildfires, bushfires as we call them. Uh, give us a bit of an idea of your experience and what you have gone through over these three, four decades. Um, well, so we would, as we were chatting yesterday, the first fires that I covered were in 1983 and they were the Ash Wednesday fires um, in Southern Australia and 47 people uh, perished in those fires. And they were predominantly in a lot of um, uh, what holiday resort areas along the coast. Um, but, um, you know, we turned up in, uh, in jeans and a t-shirt and uh, had very limited technology. We didn't have mobile phones. Um, we had no satellite phones or uh, live views or any means of getting footage out. Um, and we were jumping on the back of fire trucks and following these guys into the fires. And um, very different times to where we are now, where you know we have a lot better technology, we have uh, a lot better resources. Um, and, uh, but, you know, the fires have got bigger as we've seen, um, with both, um, uh, Black Saturday in 2009, where over 170, uh, died, um, 40 odd in one town. Um, and then of course, more recently, our New South Wales and Victorian mega fires. So, um, you know, it, it, over those years, it's, uh, apart from our workflows, also the technology has changed dramatically and also the way um, we conduct ourselves. You know, in 1983, there was no such thing as, as PPE. There was no such thing as, as bushfire training and awareness uh, or accreditation. And now we have all of those sorts of things that we need to have when we go to fires. I'll um, pick up a bit more on that uh, later. Lauren, you haven't necessarily been on many fire grounds, but it is something that you've looked at, particularly in the recovery phase. What have you, in, in ch chatting to people and, and your own observations, etc., what have you noticed about what um, is happening, uh, you know, in recent years, how things are evolving? 
Yeah, I mean, I'm not sure that this is particular to um, recent years, but I, it's something that, you know, I'm, a, a lot of my reporting, um, both related to fires and environmental catastrophes and also related to migration um, and, and the crossover has to do, it focuses on sort of the time period after the cameras are gone, right? And after the sort of flood of journalists that show up at the beginning. Um, and I know um, all of our co-panelists have, have done this work as well, as well as some folks in the audience. Um, and what, what really strikes me every time I talk to people is this sense that um, there's, there's in the popular imagination of the, the sort of brackets on when the disaster begins and ends is very short, right? The lifespan in the, in the imagination of a crisis from outside of the crisis place um, is, is very short, whereas the feeling of disaster and catastrophe um, and, and sort of trauma and the need to rebuild and the, the sense that like the, the, this is still an active crisis that we're living a year, two years later um, after the fire is over um, is, is, is pretty tremendous. And I guess what I would say, um, the, the difference in the past several years is that we have so many fires that I think the lifespan is even shorter because it's like, it's so, it's, we have whiplash and we don't even know where to look, you know, um, like we forget the names of fires because in California because there are so many of them. So that's that's something um, that 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 I've noticed quite a bit. That, picking up on that, you know, uh, Peter's talking about Ash Wednesday. It used to be a day. It was Ash Wednesday and Black Saturday. And we just had Black Summer last year. And while the predictions for what we're about to go into in Australia are not as dire as they were a year ago, thankfully, mm. um, uh, you know, it's it, it has become quite different. I'm going to come back to you, Lizzie, because I'm fascinated by the fact that you're a fires reporter. Uh, you know, we don't, that that is seems to be an extraordinary decision that the San Francisco Chronicle has made to actually dedicate you. Tell us how that works. Obviously, you're there for the fires, but a big important part seems to be that you embed yourself in a community um, for the before, the during, and the after. Yeah, you know, it's funny because I don't think it was so much an intentional decision as that is just sort of what happened. Um, I had just left covering local politics in 2017 when the wine country wildfires had started. And after that, that was the worst fire that we had seen in California up to that point. And my editors really wanted to put a focus on what it looked like to recover from something like that, if recovery was even possible. So I embedded in Santa Rosa and the surrounding communities for about a year, just writing about normal things and how not normal it is once a community is decimated. Like the tiny little strip mall where, you know, the businesses survived, but all their customers were gone. So they were slowly going out of business. Or what do you do when the fire burns so hot that all the infrastructure underground starts to melt? So that was my way of really putting a human face on it and adding context to fires so they aren't just some violent scary thing that you see come and go but you actually understand the ways in which the environment and people are impacted so you know 2017 passes 2018 arrives and I remember thinking like oh shoot what do I do now it's been a year since the wine country fires and lo and behold like a month later the campfire broke out in paradise so I followed that recovery for about a year and it seems like every summer right when i'm on the precipice of being like okay it seems like maybe now is the time to move on to something else there are more destructive fires and even more of an imperative to get people to understand why this matters and you know ball fire can be really destructive for people and their property why it's also a thing you need in the environment and the nuance keeps growing so i've been unable to tear myself away so three years later i'm still here still doing the same job but i really love it and what kind of protocols do you have to go through? Do you have accreditation? What kind of relationship do you have with the fire authorities? For example, in Australia, uh, we have to actually be accredited with our fire agencies. We have to do online courses. Now, they slightly change between the states, as does what you're able to do. And I'm going to get Peter to pick on, on that at the moment. But Lizzie, if you can just give us a brief idea of, you know, what are the mechanics of, you know, being able to actually cover a fire? If I turn up to... California as a journalist from Australia, what do I do to be able to cover your fires? Right. So we are very lucky in California in that journalists are protected under the penal code and we are allowed to access disaster zones, including wildfires. So when you drive up to that checkpoint that might be manned by the CHP or a small town cop, uh, they have to let you in. It would be illegal for them not to. 
sometimes they aren't always familiar with the law and you just say, oh, it's under California Penal Code 409, you have to let me in and you show them your press badge and they're like, okay, and they let you go. Um, it's harder in other states like Colorado, you can't get to the front lines of fires or back into the zone. And I think it really lends itself to storytelling here. But at the very least, you do need some kind of press badge to show that you are a journalist. Otherwise, they might not believe you and not let you back. I know that there have been issues with um, freelancers not being able to get back to the fire zone. Peter, I'd like you to pick on that. I pick up on that. You're the one who's kind of, you know, as you were telling us earlier, once upon a time, you didn't need any of that. Now you do need accreditation, but you were going between, you know, the, the thing about wildfires is they don't, uh, bushfires, they don't recognise borders, right? So last year in, we had this sort of huge fire that went from Victoria into New South Wales and Peter and a number of other, other crews and reporters were kind of going between our states and that becomes problematic because there are jurisdictional issues. So Peter, I'll get you to chat a little bit about the experiences you had so, for example, here in Victoria, we were so limited. I covered, went in for two tours of duty in January, did not film a flame. And then in New South Wales, our colleagues were really, really close, a bit frightening for someone like me who watches and is scared of the trauma they're going through. But Peter, tell us about your experience between those two states. Mm. Yeah, well, as, as I said earlier, in, in the 1980s, no PPE and no accreditation. Now we have to do accreditation every two years. Uh, which is uh, online, uh, and that involves obviously doing various components and then answering questions and passing. Now, that accreditation for our state of Victoria is recognised uh, in every other part of Australia. Uh, it's highly regarded, but our state doesn't recognise anybody else's accreditation. So that makes it very difficult um, if, for example, we're overwhelmed and we need relief from our colleagues interstate to come and help, they can't get across the border um, with their accreditation. So a lot of those guys end up doing local backfill uh, while we all go out to the fires. Now, in Victoria, as you said, Karen, very limited where you can go to. If you drive down a road and it's blocked by a local council worker, you are uh, in serious trouble of getting fined uh, for crossing that, that control point. Um, and they basically put perimeters up around towns or areas as such. In New South Wales, uh, you can hop on a fire truck. They have very different rules. The, the, in Victoria, the police control um, the in and out. Uh, in New South Wales, the fireies control who goes in and out. Uh, and the police play a secondary role to that. And so the fireys actually give you a lot more access. They, they want to be seen. They want you to get the pictures. They want to uh, appear on television themselves. Um, so they'll take you in. And we found in Victoria, just like you, very limited getting uh, pictures of flames. But in New South Wales, we were escorted right to the front. And, you know, uh, there we were, on, on roadways and uh, in the bush surrounded by fire, uh, but also surrounded with five different fire trucks um, circling the wagons around us um, at one of the mega fires. And we just, you just can't do that in Victoria. What it does lead to in Victoria, unfortunately, is a lot of uh, cowboy media um, breaking the rules and heading off uh, down roads and back roads and whatnot to try and get access because the media, the media units of the emergency services won't even facilitate it. So it makes it very difficult. Um, and it, there's, it's such a contrast between the different states. Well, Lauren, I want to bring you in here. Um, when the media moves on, and I had an experience again in January where we were, you know, a week after there'd been fires in a particular area where there'd been a huge media mob. Um, and we came into town doing a bit of a how business is recovering. What are you doing to adapt to the fact that you don't, you don't have uh, customers anymore? And we were doing some filming in the bakery and, you know, there was this kind of somebody was sort of sniping at the side and it was just like I, I hadn't come across that kind of hostility before. But it was two weeks after there'd been this huge media mob come in, take over the town. Um, you know, we can be rude, obnoxious, particularly as Australian journalists. Um, what, 
do when, when you've sort of been talking about that recovery when you go in afterwards people go in afterwards what is the response to some of that kind of media just infiltration on a community and then they pull out suddenly too I mean, I think it can feel um, absolutely like like an overwhelming mob in the moment, um, but I also think it can feel like a bit of a betrayal. Um, and and I, I imagine my co-panelists can speak to this as well, but I feel like a bit of a betrayal when everyone goes away, right? Like there's a mob when there are flames and then when it's all just rubble and char, everyone's gone. And I think, I mean, I think a lot about this in, in, in all of the journalism I do in the migration reporting that, and it's something I've been thinking a lot about now, you know, we in journalism talk about the people in our stories as characters. Oh, who's the character that's going, this story is going to focus on? Who's the character that I'm, you know, who's going to, like, through which I'm going to tell the story? And I understand the shorthand of that, but I actually think that there's some real interrogation that we, um, as a, as a, um, as a profession need, need to do around, like, that's a pretty loaded term, right? How how, how do we reduce um, the people in our stories? Um, or how is there kind of a profession-wide um, expectation that we can effectively use people in order to tell a larger story? Um, and then what, so the question that I am always asking myself, and I think that this is implicit in some of that hostility you're mentioning and some of the uh, kind of sense of abandonment, like you came in and then you, and then everyone came in and then they just sort of left. Like, what is our, um, our responsibility to people after this the 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 crisis is over what is our response you know that appears over to us is in the flames are quelled um how do we kind of have a longer view of that crisis and also how do we um do better by the people that we're writing about so that we're not just um sort of using the people as props to tell a story but actually really really centering the story on their experience and letting that be be the guide versus kind of like our preconceived sense of, of what the story should be I see that a lot especially in like immediate crisis reporting it's like there's a cookie cutter version of the story and it gets told again and again and again and this is not particular to fires um but but to crisis reporting more generally and Lizzie, you've kind of broken the mold on that one. I was really, I think it was in a Lauren piece uh, where she sort of said, you know, you were actually forewarning one of the communities you were dealing with about, hey, this is what's going to happen in your community. Walk us through that and talk us through that a little bit about how you, you know, connect with those communities and try and prepare them for this media onslaught. Right. Well, I think covering the wine country wildfires 2017, wow, not 2007, though it feels like a decade ago now. Um, when you spend a lot of time in a community, you really get to know it and to love it and to know the people and overhear a lot of really candid conversations about how they feel they're being pictured and how a lot of times they feel almost taken advantage of, like people parachute in and really all they have left is their story. That is the most precious thing to them. They might have lost a loved one, lost their home, and then to then lose their story in a way that they didn't feel like was truthful or, or accurate is just more pain on top of pain. So now when I'm going into new communities, I try really hard to talk to the people who are community leaders and just tell them, you know, I, I cover fires. After this, I'm not going to go away. I will come back and talk to you about issues that you might think other people need to know about. I think there's this sense of frustration, like Lauren had mentioned, that when the flames are burning and the pictures are great and you can get wonderful B-roll, like all the journalists want to be there. But then, you know, when the town council is trying to figure out what to do because the town is contaminated and people can't live there, but they have no houses and they want to live in their trailers, there aren't many people covering the unsexy issues of what actually, how you deal with that, how you grapple with it. So I try and focus my reporting on those day-to-day -day challenges and just putting you in someone's shoes and kind of giving you that sense of compassion of knowing how hard it is when you're wearing someone else's clothes and living in like 200 square feet and your life has been flipped upside down. Like what that actually looks like in the day-to-day -day when you aren't running from the fire or your car is melting. I think those kind of TikTok stories can only do so much service, but then at a certain point, you have to start writing and showing and storytelling what it's like to live with climate change and the ways in which these people's lives are so forever altered. 
I'll pick up on uh, the climate change issue in a moment, but Peter, I want to go to you. When you and I were sort of having a discussion yesterday, um, you know, you were sort of noting that once upon a time you just went in, out, did the fire. Now we do so much more. It's probably as much the the 24 hour news cycle and we've got, you know, time to fill and there's also the social media stuff. But, you know, we're now doing anniversaries and we're also going in there to do some of those aftermath stories. Um, tell us a little bit about the, the sort of shift you've seen along those lines. Uh, yeah, you're absolutely, you're absolutely right. I mean, I don't ever recall having done any anniversaries from Ash Wednesday. Uh, I'm sure the community's held them, uh, but um, we didn't, I don't recall us ever ever covering them, and you're right. We just we wanted we wanted burnt buildings, we wanted flames, and uh, uh, you know um, all of that all of that sort of stuff. Whereas now um, we do we do do anniversaries, but we also do the recovery process, and uh, you know it's just as much uh, it's it's just as important. Uh, for us, and particularly for our network, where we are also the emergency broadcaster uh, in Australia, um, that we stay connected with those communities um, and we develop uh, relationships, as Lizzie talks about, and that we do come back and tell those recovery stories. And it's important because we, we all move on to the next thing. And what happened in here in Australia is absolutely typical where... Um, you know, we were all all madly talking about mega fires all through Christmas and New Year, uh, and when we would normally be back doing all of these recovery stories, we were hit with COVID, and we haven't been able to go anywhere. Uh, all the borders are closed, and communities are closed, and so on. So, um, but that shift is different, and we've also talked about the science of the fires. Uh, which is not what we would have done in the 80s. We talk about climate change. We talk about drought. Uh, we talk about, you know, where, where, how we're going to deal with this moving forward. Um, interestingly, though, in some of the communities, they don't necessarily want to chat about climate change. They don't want to chat about how much um, uh, litter is on the floor of the forest and so on and so on. Um, they just want to know when they're going to get their house built and uh, fences put back up and um, so there's 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 a difference too in what the city wants to know and what the what the country wants to know yeah and just for context for those of you not in australia the australian broadcasting corporation as peter has mentioned is the emergency broadcaster so that means we have these regional stations and rural stations that will pick up literally okay from they'll pick up whatever is coming from the fire authorities and say it's an act and watch on these particular roads or it's an emergency, you've got to, and they'll go into that for hours and hours and hours on end. So uh, that's a really crucial service that we, uh, and then in between kind of the, the action watch, it's like, hey, Bruce calls up from such and such and says, oh, look, I've just moved all my sheep to whatever paddock or I've just filled up, you know, I've gone to the local town and filled up my water uh, containers, etc." So it's a very um, intimate, interestingly, having sort of sat and listened to it for, uh, hours on end during January. It's very intimate, but it's also a real connection with communities. The ABC also um, has in increasingly sort of done coordinated coverage. For example, last year was the 10th anniversary of Black Saturday, which really was a turning point in fire coverage and concerns about how the fire authorities were prepared, responses, etc., and just this absolutely devastating, um, dreadful, people still, uh, you know, really devastated by that. Um, and this year, as Peter mentioning, you know, we haven't been able to go back to a lot of those communities and, you know, funds were promised, uh, people were supposed to be able to rebuild and, and so much of that just hasn't happened. So, Lauren, I want to come into you because you um, talk about the ethics uh, of a lot of this. And, and I think one of the things that I've been thinking about a lot is how we deal with people who've been traumatised. Um, I kind of ask myself is just, you know, those times when I've kind of been, when somebody's rushing past and I've kind of thrown a microphone in their face and it's always respectful and it's always, uh, you know, I'm not a rude or, or difficult person, but I wonder you know, how much consent has that person really given to me to interview them if they're kind of, you know, dashing from their home, they're in a state of crisis or trauma or stress? 
Um, what what are your sort of observations on how reporters and news crews, etc., uh, are dealing with the ethics of this? Obviously, there's you know lots of bad ethical journalism in all of our countries, but there's good. What, what would be the best practice to be dealing with people in that sort of scenario? Yeah, um, it's a great question, and the question of sort of consent in times of of crisis is 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 a really good one. Um, I would say as a print journalist, um, there's a little bit more room because I don't have to turn the recorder on right right away, and I don't. Um, and again, I, I mostly. Uh, while I've 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 done a lot of reporting in sort of other disasters, um, I've not done a lot of on the ground reporting in in fire. So I just want to mention that. But I I think that the thing is about interviewing people who are um, who have been really traumatized or who are like in the throes of a traumatic experience. Time is critical. Like giving them time to think, giving them time to hear and digest what the questions that you're asking, or even the pre questions that you're asking, or these consent questions, is really, really critical. And I understand um, from a journalist perspective, it's like fast, fast, fast. We got to get this. We got to go. But I think it's that same instinct, you know, that 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 sort of expediency over, um, like prioritized over. Um, the sort of experiences of the people that we are interviewing that does reduce people to characters um, in, in, in the narrowest way. And I also think, um, frankly, it leads to the kind of journalism that is more cookie cutter. You know, I think that with the time, and, and I know it's always a race against time, um, and, and there are some real public uh, concerns about getting the information out there quickly. But the fact is that to get a story that is complex um, and true and, and, and interesting, and ethical um, is something that takes an investment of time. Lizzie, what, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, you would see lots of reporters come and go. Yeah, I completely agree with Lauren. I feel like so much when you drop into these fire zones, I oftentimes feel like an untrained therapist trying to help someone understand what they've just experienced. And I do feel like a lot of the time they they are really open to talking and for the most part they understand the issue of consent um, and that they have a story to tell and they can tell it to someone who they don't have to necessarily worry about what the reaction will be the way they would if they were telling this story to their friend or to their family member. So I always try really hard just to start back from the beginning and be like, hey, can you tell me about yourself? Where did you grow up? How did you end up here? Slowly lead them into it and just be like, okay, I think, you know, I'm going to start asking you some harder questions now. Do you feel ready for that? Please let me know. If you can. And then I think by the end of the interview, it's really important to wade out of that experience with them too. You don't want to be like, hey, can you tell me about the hardest thing that's ever happened to you? Okay, great. I'm going to go now. Actually taking the time to sit with them and be like, so what did you make of that? Where, do you, where are you finding hope? What other plans do you have for today? Taking those slow steps back out, regardless of how much time it takes. You know, I was on a phone interview one time with someone and spent five hours on the phone with them just because they were having such a hard time. And that's not right to leave someone, to ask them to go to those hard places with you and then just leave them to figure out how to get out of the hole by themselves. So I think it's really important to understand that the person that you're interviewing is a human. It's not a character. It's not just some hole for your story. And that by taking the time to actually ask them real questions that are also unrelated to the trauma that they went through, you'll end up with a richer story and with information that you never even would have expected to receive. So I think just at the end of the day, just to preserve that humanity and not get too jaded or too caught up in the deadline and just take the time to look and to listen and to see and to include that in the story. Peter, that sort of brings me, I guess, to the whole kind of trauma-informed approach when it comes to reporting. Um, you know, in the 24-hour news, uh, digital, getting stuff out on Twitter quickly, et cetera, um, how, when you're kind of juggling that in the field, how are you able to, um, you know, give us some of the nuts and bolts of how you would deal with that? You know, you're stirring up all of these emotions in somebody um, and then we have to walk away. How do you approach that? 
uh, you mean dealing with them or dealing with us? But firstly, dealing with them, and then we'll get on to us. Yeah. Um, well, it's I don't know. It's it's uh, it, it's tricky because um, you know if you're into if if you're interviewing uh, you know the local mayor or someone uh, you know in a in a in a authoritative role, um, you know it it uh, you know it's often just they're, they're they're following the process like everybody else, and they're reasonably easy to deal with, although that doesn't mean that we should forget that they're obviously equally affected by what's happening in their community and uh, perhaps loss of life and, and friends and colleagues. Um, but uh, I, I find it harder when we're probably dealing with the common person who's not used to the media, um, not used to having, you know, a camera uh, in front of them and uh, microphones and all of those sorts of things. And they're, you know, they're, they're obviously country folk uh so they're not used to uh that um invasion and i and i and it's also hard when we travel on mass uh like a little swarm <laughs> and kind of land on someone and often if you see one crew uh media crew pulled up somewhere you often pull up next to them and jump out and start doing the same thing and always feel bad for these people who are suddenly gone from rounding up sheep or whatever they're doing on their property to suddenly being confronted by microphones and 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 people in yellow asking them a lot of questions that they really don't have the answers to and and quite often you're dealing with people who not even don't even know what's happened to them and uh, don't know how to communicate that it's very hard Lauren did you want to pick up on that or not? I see you nodding furiously yeah, I was, I, I just, um, honestly, I don't think I have anything to add to what these wonderful people have said, except um, to maybe uh, just say that there's the, there's the trauma um, and overwhelm of the, um, the people who, the communities that we're writing about, which is, um, of course, first and foremost, um, and, and very central, but I think something that does not get talked about enough, um, and although you mentioned it, Karen, really briefly um, at the beginning, I'm not sure if you're going here, is, um, is the, the degree of that, yeah, okay. <laughs> So sorry if I'm jumping the gun, but I'll just say um, the kind of accumulation of trauma um, on the journalists themselves. Um, and it's interesting. I did a piece for CJR earlier this year um, about um, basically about Lizzie <laughs> and Lizzie's um, incredible work um, and and fire reporting more general, but more generally. But I was simultaneously writing a piece um, about vicarious trauma for immigration attorneys. Um, so it was really interesting to be um, speaking um, at length and getting to follow the work of this uh, brilliant uh, fire reporter while also, and this came into a lot of our conversations while also learning a lot about the sort of science of, of, of vicarious trauma. Um, and um, it's, 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 it's pretty stunning in, in its effects and it can be really pernicious. Um, so the folks who are cons consistently reporting on fires um, are holding a lot of trauma within them themselves, I think, or it can at least it's it, it's a risk that I think is under discussed. Which brings us to Lizzie, who's been <laughs> uh, reporting on fires for years and years and years. When I read, and I think it was again in Lauren's article about you know you and a colleague driving in in tandem, I think, and then suddenly coming across the live power poles, I was just I was just dread. I kind of stopped in my tracks, just I could envisage myself. Talk us through that, what happened there and, and um, how you found yourself in that situation. Right, so my colleague Gabriel Lurie, who is a photographer that I work with pretty often and I were driving up to Paradise after the campfire. And of course, because we didn't really understand the local roads, we decided to take Honey Run Road, which is probably the worst choice we could have made. It's this twisty, windy, narrow road that goes up the side of Butte Creek Canyon. And it was just absolutely strewn with downed power lines. And we had no idea whether they were live or not. I mean, I think we had a pretty good idea that they were probably not electrified, but you also never really know which is why firefighters also just have a rule of never touching power lines. And, but because this road was so narrow, we also couldn't turn around. So the only way out was to keep going. And at one point, my car got stuck on a big power cable. And it was a very terrifying moment being like, oh my God, is this how it's gonna be? Um, I mean, spoiler, we made it out okay because I'm sitting here on this tree stump talking to you. But I think there are moments like that that happen when you're trying to tell the story from 
navigating these environments where everything is destroyed and the trees are falling and in the back of your mind you're always just very aware of the fact that you know something could happen and I think you're even more aware of it because you're talking to so many people who have been hurt by fire or had their cars melted and there's just really no way to 100% forecast how a fire will act or behave and that can be really hard day in and day out to manage that stress and to compartmentalize it well enough to do your job and it's just yeah it's it's hard and I I'm still learning how to deal with that I think earlier in my career I had a couple of mentors that made it seem like I was never allowed to talk about my own experiences that you're just supposed to follow it and continue on and do the work as if nothing's wrong and I think the stories that you cover become part of you and it becomes part of your story too and to acknowledge anything less than that is doing a disservice. Peter Drought is a peer supporter um, uh, like I was with the Australian Broadcasting Corporation and um, has dealt with trauma. So let's pick up there Peter on how you know you and I've never covered a bushfire together but we've covered other pretty awful events together and, um, you know, having peers to be able to chat to about it um, is so important. So tell us a little bit about um, some of your experiences in dealing with uh, your colleagues who've been going through, who, who, you know, will have had experiences like Lizzie where they've had a near miss um, and, you know, what's the best way to deal with it? Uh, well, as you say, you know, in the in the 1980s, it was uh, suck it up and deal with it. Um, this is what you're paid to do, um, and it and it really out of out of the back of the 2009 Black Saturday fires, um, where we saw a lot of a lot of fatalities and a lot of um, uh, a, a lot of property loss and all and all the rest. Um, that uh, through the work of of Kate McMahon and a former colleague. Um, Heather Forbes, they, they put together the peer support program that we have now in the ABC. And, um, uh, you know, more recently at our fires, just like Lizzie, we had a crew, um, again, interstate, were allowed into a fire area. And um, uh, they had parked their car and just got out of the car and, uh, you know, opened up the back, got their, their gear out and had just walked off uh, when a tree that had had burnt through the centre um, uh, snapped in half and uh, fell on the car and completely crushed the car, and they were both fine. The journalists had to jump out of the way when they heard the crack, but that you know they were both. That journalist still can't sit under a tree. <laughs> uh, you know, um, the minute he sits under a tree, whether it's for a picnic or work or whatever it is. Uh, he, he gets very, <clears throat> excuse me, he gets very nervous. And um, the cameraman's not too bad, but his, his wife basically said, you're not going to any more fires. Uh, we've got kids at home and uh, all of that sort of stuff. So you spend a lot of time talking to those people and uh, getting them to understand that, you know, that everything that they're going through is perfectly normal. Um, and uh, uh, if you can't help them, we also have a... Um, uh, a, a counselling program that's provided by the ABC for our, in our network and paid for by our network and we can onwardly refer people to that service, uh, which is a free service to all staff. Um, but the peer support program has been instrumental in not just bushfires, but, you know, young journalists having their first, <clears throat> excuse me, car accident or... Um, uh, you know, dealing with, uh, you know, upset family at a, at a crime scene of sorts or, you know, any other, uh, any other situation. But, yeah, the, it's, without a doubt, it makes a huge difference being able to talk to a colleague. And as you and I know, Karen, we did that horrendous uh, uh, murder on the border. And, uh, you know, just you and I being able to talk to each other um, and offer each other even snacks of food and uh, little, little bits and pieces, which all, all make up what peer support is all about, taking care of each other, 
got us got us through that and made an absolute difference. Yes, the snacks are important as well as the chats. Um, yeah. Lauren, I want to pick up on the um, some of the climate change stuff. Why do you think? Um, you know, we had a whole lot of, and it was a lot, a lot of politics um, in January. She's like, now is not the talk about time to talk about climate change. It's not time to talk about climate change. Two, three weeks later, as these fires are going on, it's still not time to talk about climate change. Um, why do you think that might be the case? I know why the politicians don't want to talk about it, but when, as Peter was referencing earlier, when we go into communities, people don't want to talk about it either. Why is that? I mean, I think, I think on the local level, um, the the polarization, at least in the United States, that 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 we see at the top um, is reflected at the bottom, and vice versa. Right? It's sort of this reverberation of of polarization. Um, I, I I would understand um, why, uh, in the wake of someone sort of losing their home or someone's community having been devastated, um, that they wouldn't necessarily want to move di if if they were hesitant to, or if their politics didn't align with believing in climate change, which is, you know, to me personally, an increasingly sort of like stunning stance to still be um, not 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 seeing um, the science um, and realities of climate change. Although there is an entire economic and political apparatus that is uh, that exists to keep people from believing that. So it's, you know, um, uh, there's, there's, <laughs> we, we, we can, anyway, that's a whole other conversation. Um, it's not, but what I'm trying to say, it's not just people's stupidity, right? Um, people are being manipulated um, in, in sincere ways. So in any case, what I'm trying to say is I would understand that uh, in the wake, in the immediate wake, or even sort of like midterm after aftermath of, of loss, one wouldn't want to be, feel as though they're in some lecture about climate change. Um, I don't know. I, I I wonder what what Lizzie might have to say about this because um, Lizzie said some really interesting things to me. Sorry, I don't want to put you on the spot, Lizzie, but about um, the way in which you know how do we how do we narrate what climate change feels like and not necessarily um, sort of constantly be trying to beat the drum of this is climate change, but but rather almost get it the way I, I feel. And maybe I'm getting this wrong, Lizzie, but I feel like you were describing it to me as sort of how do you kind of get into the conversation about climate change through the side door to kind of avoid avoid that um, frenetic polar right you know the really interesting thing is that a lot of these fires that are so destructive are happening on the wild and urban interface which is where housing is inflammable forests and on mountains and those are areas that are stereotypically pretty conservative people that might not necessarily believe in climate change and so when I've thought about my reporting you know I've, I've done the stories before of you know the experts who are like this is climate change and this is why it matters. And I just feel from, from my approach, at least it's worked better, like Lauren has said, to find people who really are living the experience of climate change and to put a really clear and vivid example before people's eyes of saying, this is what it looks like and this is how you could be impacted too. And by the way, in the middle of this powerful narrative, here are some stats that you should consider. And by the way, this isn't just naturally happening, it is the product of man-made or man-caused climate change and just kind of slipping it in the side door. That way they're already invested in the story by the time they start hitting those points. And I, I just personally have found that that has been more um, impactful in my reporting than just say, the, like the slow drum beat of this is climate change, this is climate change, because at a certain point it just, starts to feel so infuriating because you're like, I've written this story 10 times, how come no one's listening, right? So it's just another approach to go about it. All right, last question before I hand over to your questions. Um, how Peter Drought is COVID, um, we're about to go into bushfire season now. How is that going to change things? Like here in Victoria, some of you may not be aware, but we're still in, particularly in Melbourne, we're still in, I don't even know what stage we're calling it anymore, 3.75 or something or other. Oh. Right, so we're still four, but we're kind of ramped down a little bit. Um, so we can't move beyond 25 kilometres from our house. In regional Victoria, people are able to move. Now, of course, most of the news staff or news organisations are in the cities, but the fires are outside. What's your understanding, Peter? And you would have been having discussions in the ABC about how we handle this. Um, you know, how do you handle it with, you know, people in uh, evacuation centres, for example? Um, how do camera crews move about if there are limitations on how we're allowed to actually uh, um, work? 
Well, the, the short answer is we don't actually know. Um, there's been, there has been some discussion and uh, you're right, there's a difference between metropolitan Melbourne and regional Melbourne. They have uh, a lot more freedom. Uh, for those who don't know, our network, as you mentioned earlier, Karen, has regional bureaus. So there is going to be a greater reliance on the regional bureaus to provide that coverage. Um, and the regional bureaus don't want to work uh, necessarily with any of the Melbourne CBD colleagues because they don't want that crossover um, of, uh, of, of any potential virus or whatever. So how we get out there, uh, because we are considered essential service, um, we can travel, but we're certainly not going to be out across borders because our borders are still closed. Um, and, uh, you know, you say, how are we going to get into um, refuge centres? Uh, how's the community going to get into a refuge centre? You know, so I, I, uh, let alone us working out how it's going to be done, I'm not sure if those communities have thought about it. But I guess if there's a fire coming in the short term, no one's going to worry too much about COVID. Um, but certainly there'll be restrictions and... Uh, it's 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 really going to be interesting, and I and I don't really don't have a specific answer yet, except that it is it is a point of discussion at the moment, and there's a lot of people scratching their heads. Great, I'm going to hand over to Bruce because I think um, the rest of our audience have got some great questions yes, too. So thanks yeah. for the four of you, brilliant. Thank thank all of you, and Karen, I expect you to fully participate in the questions and answers here. Um, and folks, just start throwing your questions into the chat. We'll get to as many as we can. Uh, I'll start with uh, Karen Tankard, who, who asks something that I think is interesting to American reporters. Of the Australians, what, what is the training and, and certification standard that you have to meet to cover these fires? Is that just a, a access management thing or do you have skills that you have to learn? Um, um, go on, I'll let Karen. you go first. Okay, so um, there's, most of the states will have their own um, protocols and it's an online service. They used to do them face to face, uh, but we're now kind of online. Um, so as Peter said earlier, it's every two years, but it's not just the protocols. I mean, part of it is okay, um, the guy wearing the blue bib is this and the guy wearing the green bib is that and the woman wearing the yellow is this, you know, so you know who the... So we have incident control. I don't quite know how it works in California, but, for example, in Australia, if there's a big fire, there'll be an incident control centre and that might be a, a couple of tents in a paddock surrounded by whatever machinery, you know, whatever fire trucks or police or whatever emergency services will be there and there'll be an incident controller and that will be the person that you speak to in the main on that kind of where can we go, what can we do. Uh, the, but there are also police involved. We have something called Emergency Management Victoria. Um, there are also SES. So there's a whole lot of different um, people who are, are looking after you as such. So, But it's the fire agencies that accredit us. And you must have an accreditation pass to be able to get onto a fire zone. You also must have uh, equipment, proper equipment, and that's hats and gloves and uh, I wear uh, boots, all sorts of stuff. You also, uh, we will routinely have provisions, etc., with us, but you cannot get onto a fire ground without it. Um, and it's more than just knowing who's who. It's, you know, I learnt, uh, took me, you know, I was this old when I understood that a fire goes uphill much faster than it goes downhill. And kind of, of course it does, because it's going to go, whoosh, but so it, there's actually some really interesting stuff about how, how, um, fire travels and how fast it can be and how quickly it can spread. So it's actually very helpful for that point of view. Uh, but yeah, you're not going to get on a fire zone without it. Pete, you want to add anything there? Uh, yeah, well, I was just going to say it's, it's, uh, there's no cost to our organisation. Uh, it's a free service. Uh, the interesting thing is in, in our state, in Victoria, we have three different fire services. Uh, and they don't all all get along. <laughs> uh, but, uh, you know, you have your metropolitan uh, fireys, which uh, CBD fireys, and they'll often back up. Then you'll have your country fire service, but we also have a forest fire service. 
um, and and they don't get along with anybody, <laughs> uh, and they don't allow you access. So they look after after national parks and all of that sort of stuff, um, and the rest of the guys do do property and uh, uh, farms and lots of stuff. Mm -hmm. But it's 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 an easy module to do online. Um, and uh, you have to pass it. And once you pass it, you get a photo ID, just like you would uh, a, a corporate uh, ID. And you must wear that and present it when asked. And uh, you must have, don't always have to wear your PPE, but you must carry it at all times and um, certainly wear it when you're on a fire ground. And Lizzie and Lauren, how did you become fire literate? Just just exp rank experience or what? what was... What did each of you do? Lizzie's more uh, fire than so. I actually went through a professional firefighting academy with Marin County just because I wanted to learn more about fire and also I was really tired of people looking at me and being like, oh, she clearly knows nothing about fire. So now it's really nice to waltz up and be like, actually, I have my fire accreditation too. Um, <laughs> but uh, the <laughs> At the very beginning, uh, Cal Fire, which is the state firefighting agency in the state of California, came to our newsroom and just did a very basic media briefing saying, you know, this is how you keep yourself safe. This is the kind of PPE, which is personal protective equipment that you should have. And that was just a very good basic yeah. um, rundown. But there's also a lot of books out there to read if you want to learn more about behavior and the history of fire. So lots of you can do. But certainly in the U.S., we have nothing like the structure of, of that in-depth kind of experience that uh, Karen and Peter, you both have. Um, Sarah Diamond, who is uh, in Sonoma and an incoming Columbia Journalism School master's student. Uh, hello, Sarah. Uh, says, I'm curious, with all the ongoing fires and stories, how do you get people to continue to pay attention? You try to tell the stories in new ways and from new and different perspectives. And actually, Peter, I'm going to ask you first, because visually, you know, you're making that visual impression. How, how do you think about getting people to keep looking? Uh, gee, interesting question. Um, well, in the probably in the last five years or so, technology has made a huge difference. So I'm not. I think a lot of my American colleagues use things like LiveView and Digero and uh, so on, which allows people to um, not drag a big satellite truck around with them. We can go live from. Uh, a lot more locations than what we normally would. So being able to actually, um, rather than just shoot something and then cut it and send it back and it goes to where, you know, a couple of hours later or whatever, we can now be live from virtually any location uh, nearby and work in a small team. And so those stories, we can get them out quicker um, and we can get pictures out quicker. We can get information out quicker. Um, and I think that also connects the audience with somebody more personally um, because they're right there with them uh, and they're hearing that story as it's unfolding rather than waiting till the 7 p.m. news or the 6 o'clock news several hours later and playing catch up. So I think that technology for us has made a huge difference in how we deliver things and using uh, smaller cameras and drones. Drones have made a massive difference. I've seen some remarkable being, drone footage from Australia. Oh, yep. Extraordinary. Um, so we're using those more and, and that to really give people sitting at home um, a, a very clear aspect of, of, of the expanse of the destruction and, uh, property loss and so forth is, uh, has made a, a massive amount of difference. Mm -hmm. um, Lizzie and Lauren, how, how do you think about this? How, how are you keeping the story fresh for readers um, as it cycles over and over again and, you know, keeps coming back? Lizzie, how about you? Yeah, you know, I like to think about stories 
in terms of, it's about fire, but it's also not about fire at all. It's about people's lives and the things that they're experiencing. And I think that you can keep it fresh and get people to pay attention by, by changing the formula, right? By like the 10th story you read of someone digging in the ashes for their wedding ring, you're just gonna stop wanting to read that headline. But if the story is about, you know, this ballet studio that burned down and all their costumes burned down, but they're still putting on the Nutcracker in December, even though it's like later than usual and the lead ballerina had to move to another state, you might read that story. So I think it's just about finding new ways of approaching it and finding new ways of engaging people and showing them, you know, this is what the fire is about. This is what happens afterwards. This is how people are trying to move on and rebuild their lives, even as the fire is still burning. Mm -hmm. Lauren, you've, I mean, you have your own reporting, but you've also looked at what other writers like Lazier are doing. Yeah. How do you think about this one? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think about it as like no one story is the same. And so whether, and, 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 um, you know, this was just illustrated beautifully. I mean, um, the form of the story, the form and format of the story matters. So is this um, a long form, you know, 5,000 word story, or is this a breaking news story? What is the purpose of the story? Is the story to get, there, there had been a, I saw a really great question before of like, how do you balance like who the audience is, right? So is the purpose of the story to like give a broad overview of this particular fire that's burning in California? So for example, my East Coast family um, is reading the news news um, and, and, and learning about sort of, you know, what, 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 what we're living in here, or, or is it for the community itself? Is it, is the story to get critical, like mm -hmm. up to date beat by beat information for the community itself? This was something that came up um, with uh, the former editor in chief of the Chronicle who said this really lovely thing that's really stuck with me. Like, look, our fire map um, is not, and our outage map are not going to win the Pulitzer, but they should, because that is a critical, you know, it's not a narrative journalism, like hashtag long thing but it is a that like if if we remember that journalism is for the public is a public good that is for the public service it's not just an entertainment industry that is a method of storytelling um and that is that is that is storytelling and critical information right or is it a shorter sort of second day piece right so so i think it, part, part of it is is really being clear as as the writer um and as the news outlet of like what is the purpose of the story um and and sort of like who is the audience and what are we trying to do here and i think there is that that crucial phase isn't there in the immediate uh immediate aftermath of a fire or any disaster in which public health information transportation information all of that stuff is in fact a matter of journalism saving lives journalism reuniting families journalism being the basic community infrastructure when it's been destroyed but that then leads me and here i'm going to sort of seize the chair's privilege for a minute. Uh, sorry, folks, I'll get back to the chat in a minute, but there's a, there's a related question, which is about the, long, the longer aftermath and community recovery and charting and covering community recovery. Um, my, the DART Center's uh, chair, Meredith Frank Ockberg, likes to talk about a second act of trauma coverage. And, um, you know, that act one, the breaking news, sometimes gets all the attention. It's where the dramatic pictures are. Yet for people's lives, that year, two, three years of rebuilding and of remembering and of archiving are important. Um, maybe Karen and Peter talk first about how the ABC does this, because I know there have been some remarkable kind of community reporting initiatives to think about that. Karen, you want to take us? Yeah, there's. Yeah, there have been a lot of um, outside broadcasts. So, you know, we bring a team of radio producers and, and reporters and, and key um, anchors to smaller communities and, and sort of talk to the major players and the bakery person and actually spend, you know, a day there. And, um, and some of our programs will do that, go and actually host uh, their programs out, you know, in these particular places and not necessarily in the the well-established where everybody's gone kind of thing. So there's been quite a lot of that kind of coverage via radio and, and, and television specials as well. Uh, we've had, we have a big program called Quest Q and A question and answer where um, one of the reporters who was in the New South Wales bushfires coverage did a major area, a major um, program out of there. So there's those kind of specialty programs. I guess the thing that the ABC also has as well as the emergency broadcasting, 
um, is that, you know, we'll have live blogs and they all kind of feed into each other. When I'm out in the field, I'm actually feeding photographs, you know, I'm putting them up on social media. I'm sending them to our blog team. Um, you know, we're sending, we might send a, uh, a, what we would call an as live. So I'll do it. It's a live cross as such, but it's just me ranting for a minute that gets sent that can be used by our, net, our News 24 channel. Or I might do um, an interview. We were at a sitting outside a firehouse in a small town when a big truck turned up and a whole lot of um, people from the Muslim community in Melbourne just started unloading food. Um, and the word got out and people, the locals sort of came and picked up food and it was partly for the firefighters and partly. So there's, I did an interview with the guy there, you know, quickly sort of turning that around. So we can do a lot of things at the ABC because we've got this cross platform. But yes, there's also sort of these specials that we do um, to try and kind of ensure that the community knows what we're doing. And they, you know, we've had, um, what do you call it, crowdsourcing of stories and what matters to you, those kinds of projects as well. Mm. Lauren and, and, and Lizzie, I, you know, I think when we think about recovery from natural disasters in the U.S., we think about something that kind of comes once and then the community rebuilds. But you're now looking at a region where you're getting cyclical fires um, and where there are probably some very distinct community and mental health aftermath issues. What do you think needs more coverage? What do you think reporters not just you too, but in general, what what should we as a profession be looking at more closely as aftermath issues? I think we need to look at the nuances of what recovery even looks like, right? There's this gut punch reaction of, if it burns down, we must rebuild it. And obviously, the decision making that goes into that is very complicated, but I feel like there needs to be more nuanced reporting that discusses what is at stake if a place will quickly burn again and again, whether that is a smart idea to rebuild in that spot. But by like doing it through the eyes of the people on the ground as they're making those decisions. If they are going to rebuild, how are they going to do it safely? Do they understand the risk that they are living in? If their community and move somewhere else. I think we've, we've focused a lot on the issue of climate change and the issue of the wildfires and less so on what happens next. Um, our role here is outcomes and help us understand what things could look like and what people are doing. And I've seen less about that. I think we could use more of that coverage in the news. Lauren, what do you think? Yeah, I echo that. Um, I mean, this is like, th this is the, the trick, how to make something like this interesting, but like the bureaucratic hurdles to rebuilding a house um, in the aftermath of disaster are so oppressive. It's it's kind of astonishing from everything like, you know, oh, well, now there's like new fire regulations that says we can't build with this old, you know, uh, material, but the material sold out. And now if I'm going to use a new material, I have to get new draft plans drawn up and approved by the, like, you know, whatever county, whoever approver, but then they're overwhelmed because they're, there's one person approving 500 different plans. You know, I mean, it's like, how do you narrate that in a way that's interesting, but it's also really critical. I guess the other thing I would say is just like, um, which isn't a direct answer to your question, but I guess it just, it, it, it feels important to note, right? The more we're covering climate change events as concise events and these kind of catastrophes with a, 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 a you know, with sort of a, a, a clear boundary around when they begin and end, the more we abstract climate change, right? So this recovery, writing about the recovery and the long recovery and sort of like writing about disaster as not just disaster then recovery, but more like, you know, including all of that as part of the disaster, I think will help train us to understand um, in, in a deeper and more visceral way that climate change is sort of always, like we're always living this and that it's punctuated by these catastrophes, but those catastrophes have, have cast long shadows. Um, Joe Height from the University of Central Oklahoma and past DART Center uh, Executive Committee President um, is wondering, to, would like to hear a little more about the 
Australian Broadcasting Corporation's peer support program. But I want to broaden his question out a little bit since we have five minutes left here. And maybe ask each of you, what kinds of self-care strategies have worked for you? What kinds of either collegial support or individual sort of things do you do in managing yourselves during and after these overwhelming events? Uh, Karen, Peter, just maybe start by talking a little bit about the ABC and then we'll go to Lauren and Lizzie on this. I'll defer to Peter because he was one of the co-founders of the ABC's um, peer support. So he can talk to that and then I'm happy to pick yeah. up on some of my self-care <laughs> issues. Great. Um, yeah, look, we, 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 we kicked off uh, with Kate, um, Kate McMahon and uh, a former colleague, Heather Forbes. Um, you know, they, they kicked off the peer support program and, and uh, I immediately stuck my hand up uh, to, to be a part of that process because we'd, we'd never had anything uh, like that before. And there'd, there'd been different discussions and a couple of false starts, but um, really as a peer supporter, um, you know, you're, we're not trained psychologists. Um, we don't pretend to be. Um, we are people who have, um, in most cases, uh, walked the same path. We've done the same role and we've shared similar experiences. So when you're, when you're talking to a peer supporter, you're talking to someone who understands it um, and has, has worked in the field or, or some other area. Um, and our peer support encompasses uh, all fields. Um, we are multi-platform, so we cover digital, radio and television. We also cover people who, who are not just in the field uh, they're also sitting in an edit booth, for example. So, you know, they've got to cut the footage that's being sent back from the field. We've got people who sit in what we call news exchange. So they're taking in footage that's often raw and uncut coming in from overseas. Um, it might be a, a radio journalist or someone online who's got a, a editor script that someone else has written and um, uh, all of that sort of stuff. So, um, uh, I've lost my train of thought, yeah. Bruce. No, but, that's, um, that's, that, that gives us, I think, a really good sketch. Yep. And, it, and now yep. is a well-established program. It was the first in the world, but now Absolutely. there are mm. a number of other major news organizations that have gone down yes. that path. Karen, what are, your, what are your thoughts on this? Well, I'm just opening up my self-care uh, album in, on my <laughs> phone, and it's got, um, you know, flowers. It's got, uh, you know, my husband and I in fun places. It's got my mum who passed away earlier this year who... Um, was such an inspiration to me. Um, there's a photograph of a very special lake in Canada that I like to get to that I didn't get to this year. Um, so I try to go to those kinds of images that make me happy. Um, I put on endless repeat of um, music that I like. Um, I try to kind of walk away and, and um, as my recent, most recent role has been as a court reporter where I've sat through some pretty awful testimony where you kind of can't quite believe what people do to one another. So those are the kinds of techniques I use. And I'll pick up the phone to Peter or I'll pick up the phone to my kind of peer support people and kind of go, you're not going to believe what I've just heard. And it usually it's a bit of a debrief and then I can get on with my, my, my life. But I also, I do Taekwondo. I'm not a mindfulness person. I'm not going to do yoga. I like to kick the bejesus out of things. So that has really helped as well. So um, I've got a couple of, um, and then, you know, nice glass of red wine at the end of the day and a hug with my husband helps too. Lizzie, you're, you're, you're back. We lost you for a minute, but you're back. Um, what's, what do you do to stay sane when you're out there in the middle of forest land, forest fire land or afterwards? What's your own staying sane strategy? Yeah, I try to keep some clear delineation between when work is ending and my personal life is starting, whether that is like taking a bath or having a glass of wine or saving one really special granola bar that's $1 more expensive than the rest of the shitty granola bars to eat in my car at the end of the day. I'm like, okay, once I eat this, my time starts. And I think that's really important. And also just having people to talk with who understand. Um, I'm really lucky in that I have a few good friends who are also journalists and just being able to have someone to confide in who understands all of the things that you're going through as well. And I think that is just kind of how you stay mentally sane. 
as well as doing all of the normal stuff, like treating yourself like a toddler almost. Like, okay, tonight I'm going to go to bed at 9 p.m. I'm going to eat my broccoli. I'm going to make sure <laughs> that I go for a run in the morning. And I think if you're just feeling physically healthy, it helps you stay mentally healthy too. Yeah, thanks. And Lauren, you, you've been thinking about this because of your reporting, not just um, out of, not just experientially. Where, where have you come to? Yeah, and I should also say I've, you know, worked as a social worker, effectively a social worker, a case manager at a school for um, uh, low-income immigrant youth for many years. So I've sort of experienced it as a journalist and um, and and as a reporter and as a, um, a, a reporter myself and as a reporter reporting on the phenomenon. I, I suppose that I would say that, um, and it's really heartening. I, I think that the, the the culture is shifting somewhat, but I think what, what I learned in my reporting, um, which mirrored my own personal experience, um, is that in fact, a lot of us don't want to cop to vicarious tra trauma or to sort of secondary trauma. Um, there are lots of different, you know, however we want to call it, um, because what we are seeing is so horrific. And, and um, you know, this came up earlier, this idea of like, well, I'm paid to do this. You know, it's, my house didn't burn down. You know, I, I didn't have to walk from El Salvador uh, by myself as a 17 year old kid. I, um, you know, didn't get out of this town by the skin of my teeth while I, you know, and uh, when my friends, burned to bits you know like so i think i think a, a huge part of it is just acknowledging that um that vicarious traumatization is real and and i learned a lot about the science of it which effectively is the way that vicarious trauma works on our brains mirrors exactly the way um trauma works for someone who's experienced it firsthand right so that is to say which i think and and i say this in my in my piece for vqr like i think that that's a really really stunning metaphor um that what happens to one of us sort of matters to all of us. And um, and so I think if we don't think of vicarious trauma as this sort of, oh, we're being, we're overindulging ourselves, um, but we see it as a real hazard of the job that can actually get in the way of our work. And then we also see it as a function of, of human compassion, compassion and human care. Um, I think that that goes a really long way in, in, in sort of helping us address it in whatever, you know, kind of personal tools. I find the $1 more sad granola bar to be very, ador you know, it's like even the little things, you know, are sometimes these like little <laughs> like sad treats we give ourselves um, just as an acknowledgement of like this was a hard day um, and yeah I would also say just being able to talk it through with with colleagues um, or friends is huge well thank thank you for that Lauren you're hired um, and uh, <laughs> you know thank you uh, Karen and and Peter and Lizzie too and and Lauren I thank all of you who are here this was a really remarkable conversation it could go on for a long time, but we said it would be an hour and 15 minutes. That's how long it's going to be. Um, this has been recorded. We will be doing some light editing and then putting the whole thing up as a resource to journalists. And I want to thank also uh, Isabel Thompson, who is uh, with the Dart Center and is, I believe, compiling a tip sheet off the back of this. My colleagues, Kate Black, Ara Richin, and Camille Baker, who also um, were behind the scenes driving the car. Karen, who agreed to um, do the hosting duties so that someone who actually knows what she's talking about could lead the conversation on this one. Um, if you have not already, uh, sign up for the Dart Center's email list on our website, www.dartcenter.org, where there are a number of backgrounders and tip sheets on covering fire and other disasters, on self-care, on all the kinds of issues we talked about today, and indeed some historical work on Australian uh, bushfires as well as U.S. wildfires. Um, at Dart Center is our Twitter handle. Um, keep an eye out for other conversations in this series and other Dart Center Zoom events until we can all be in the same room again. <laughs>